we just clap our hands and thank him for a minute? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's so good to us. You know, I, I, I once heard somebody say that they were talking about having faith the size of a mustard seed, and you could say to a mountain, be thou removed, and they cast the mountain into the sea. Um, but then he said, sometimes mountains aren't meant to be cast into the sea, they're meant to climb. I feel like today we're going to be climbing. We're not going to be casting anything into the sea that we're going to be climbing. You know, somebody once said that they were praying and God's, they asked God, why is this so difficult? Why is this so hard? And God simply asked them a question. Have you ever tried climbing a smooth mountain? Sometimes our walk with God is difficult, but he's always been good to us. Um, thank you, Pastor, for this opportunity. Uh, we're going to continue in our series. We're going to be talking about the altar. So you can be seated. A turning point. The exact moment that changes the direction of an activity or situation. A dividing point from which things will never be the same. It's considered momentous, though these times are often recognized in hindsight. I'm speaking of something called a watershed moment. When rain falls and you watch these droplets of water hit the ground and they go this way and that way and different directions and, and different droplets hit the ground differently and they go through different jogs here and there until it reaches its destination. A destination that could have easily been a path far away from it where it actually ended. Watershed moments happen in the blink of an eye. They come and go quickly as the water continues down its eventual to its eventual resting spot. We too have lives filled with these watershed moments, turning points that are often unrecognizable at the time, but eventually turn into major steps in our lives. Moments that come quickly and without any real warning. Unfortunately, we don't have these big giant cartoon signs that are saying, hey, this moment, pay attention to it. This is going to change your life. Watershed moments happen more often than we like to think. And it isn't until we stop and ponder our past that we see just how truly impactful certain events or, or certain decisions or even certain thoughts have changed our lives and took us into a different direction. Establishing an altar in our lives, it's one of the greatest decisions we will ever make. To decide that from here on out, no matter what happens in my life, I will go to the altar Every decision I make and everything I want, I want to take to the altar first. Because his approval means more to me than my life and my stuff. I need an altar in my life because prayer will change my perspective to become his perspective. Prayer changes situations that are impossible. Prayer changes outcomes that were once inevitable. Prayer changes outcomes of people's hearts that are cold and hardened. Prayer changes the atmosphere of my home. Prayer changes the atmosphere of cities and states and countries. Prayer changes lives. But greatest of all, prayer changes the prayer. The one praying the prayer. The greatest impact of effectual fervent prayer is felt in the individual praying the effectual fervent prayer. We can listen to sermons about prayer and we can read book, books on prayer and we can know and understand and have knowledge about prayer, but none of that is going to happen. None of that is going to work unless we actually pray. Unless I am actually praying, my life will mean very little. Having a knowledge of prayer does not take place of praying. Leonard Ravenhill said, A man may study because his brain is hungry for knowledge, even Bible knowledge, but he prays because his soul is hungry for God. 
I want to be very clear today. The importance of an altar can never be overstated. We must have an altar in our own lives, and we must have an altar in our homes, and we must have an altar in our church. I cannot claim to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, without having an altar in my life. We find in the Bible the story of a man named Elkanah. This man had two wives, one named Penina, who was able to have children, and the other was named Hannah, who was unable to have children. And we pick up the story in 1 Samuel, verse 3. It says, Each year Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Penina would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than ten sons? That's such a husband thing to say. I'd like to take the next few moments to help us to see some truths in this story that we can apply to our own lives, applications that we can take today in order to build or even repair our own altars. Because if we as a body do not have individual altars, then collectively as a group, our altar in our church will be ineffective. Now, point to yourself and say, it starts with me. Long time ago at, at the church that I grew up in, they had a sign before you walked in and it said, if everyone in this church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? If my life is out of balance, I need to check myself first. I can't correct anyone else if I'm not on the right path. I've got to rebuild my own altar before I can help anybody with theirs. I hope that this message challenges each and every one of us to take time and examine ourselves in our own altars. Hannah's brokenness and desperation drove her to the altar. Hannah was heartbroken. She was unable to have children, and whenever she would get a little down, there was Penina to provoke her. The King James Version says, And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret. Hannah had come to a crossroad, a turning point in her life, a watershed moment. What would she do? What could she do? She was depressed, desperate. Hannah needed something that she was unable to produce herself. She was barren and felt alone. Despair had gripped her. And to top it all off, when she went home, there was Penina, her adversary, to remind her that she wasn't good enough and that she didn't have what it took to be a great wife and that Penina herself was more worthy of the man that she, they had married. So what do you do when you're desperate? Where do you go in your darkest times? What do we turn to in the times of despair? I mean, the right answer we all know is that I go to God. But do we? Is that where we go in our time of need? Do we fall on our faces before him and seek him for what he desires? Kyle Eidelman in his book, God's at War, states, Where is your sanctuary? Where do you go when you're hurting? Let's say it's been a terrible day at the office. You come home and go where? To the refrigerator for comfort food like ice cream? To the phone to vent with your most trusted friend? Do you, ski, do you seek escape in novels or movies or video games or pornography? Where do you look for emotional rescue? The Bible tells us that God is our refuge and strength, our help in times of trouble. 
so much so that we will not fear though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. That strikes me as a good place to run, but it's so easy to forget, so easy to run in other directions. Where we go says a lot about who we are. The high ground we seek reveals the geography of our values. So I ask again, where do you go? What do you turn to? Let's be honest with ourselves. Let's not give the holy and righteous answer. But what do we do when things in life become difficult? Do we go to social media and let everyone know that my life is terrible? Or do we go to social media and and blast things that aren't real and show everybody that everything's perfect in my life? Maybe you remove yourself completely. Maybe you become a recluse and and go into utter darkness and and just tell people you're doing fine. I'm okay. No, No need to worry about me. Hannah went to prayer. She took the desperation and the despair she had and turned it into a prayer so desperate that she could not even speak. Verse 10 says, Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Anguish means excruciating or acute distress, suffering or pain. The very thing Hannah was feeling in the physical, she expressed in the spiritual as she gave it all to God in prayer. A prayer that changed her. A prayer that not only changed her, but changed her future and also changed the future of all of Israel. The the child that God gave her after this prayer. His name was Samuel. And if you remember Samuel, Samuel was the one that anointed the first king, Saul. And then Samuel was also the person that told Saul the kingdom was ripped from him. The Bible tells us that not a word of Samuel's fell to the ground. Samuel was a powerful, powerful prophet. The powerful thing about praying desperation prayers is that you don't care what it looks like. You don't care what it sounds like. All you know is that you need a touch from God. Pride goes out the window. Shame is no more. And a lot of times, just like Hannah, we can't speak because of the hurt we've endured. The anguish is so deep that words cannot be uttered. I've been there. Not only have I been there on my own, but I've, I've gone to that place with praying with others. When you lay your hand on someone and God allows their pain to transfer to you. And you begin to weep when, as, as God helps you to pray for that individual. It's called intercession. You're taking on someone else's pain. I've been there when God has laid lost people on my heart. And you just begin to weep for people that, that are lost and dying. I've been there, I've experienced times where God would lay that upon me. I understand the pain of lost family members and close friends who have rejected truth. There is something powerful about the prayer of brokenness and desperation. Psalm 51.17 says, The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Hannah took all the pain she had endured for years and she laid it on the altar in brokenness and desperation. Number two, Hannah trusted God. Verse 11 tells us, And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Hannah was willing to lay down everything she was asking God for on the altar in her life the most precious possession she wanted, she was willing to give it back to God. 
There was nothing too sacred in Hannah's life. There wasn't anything she wasn't willing to lay down on the altar. Everything she had was fair game for her. It didn't matter to her. Whatever God would ask, she was willing to give it. Do you trust God in the same way? Are you willing to do the same? Are you willing to lay down everything you have, everything you have ever known, everything you want in life on the altar in order to have more of Jesus Christ? You know, I've tried bargaining with God before. You can have this and this, but don't, don't take that. Or don't take that. Uh, I, I really love this thing, so I'll, I'll just give you a portion of it. Is that okay? It doesn't work that way. Bargaining doesn't, doesn't work. Hannah did not care what it took to have children. She was willing to give everything, even the very thing she was so desperate to have. You know, sometimes God will give us things and then turns around and asks for it right back. Look at Abraham, the promised child he had waited a 100 years for. He tried it his own way for a time. That didn't work out so well. Finally, this promised child, and God said, lay him down on the altar. Sacrifice. And when Abraham showed that he was willing, God said, now I know. Now I know I can trust you. But if we're not careful, we can get upset with God because he gave us the desire of our heart and now he is asking if we are willing to give it back to have more of him. If we are willing to give back the things that God has supplied in our lives, we are living in idolatry. We are serving the gift more than the giver. This is why we must have an altar in our lives that an altar that we go to every single day because it keeps us in check. The altar helps us to keep the right perspective. All of it belongs to him. My life, my family, my possessions, all his. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh, but blessed be the name of the Lord. When, when Job made that statement, he had lost everything. His children, all his possessions, he lost it all. But when we read the first chapter of Job, we understand why he was able to make it through the horror that his life had become. Verse 5 tells us he would get up early in the morning and offer, burnt, offer a burnt offering for each of them. Speaking of children, for Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Job understood the power of an altar. Job had great possessions, but his greatest possession was his altar before the Lord. Job knew how to pray, just like Hannah knew how to pray. She understood that everything she had in this life meant very little if she did not have an altar to the Lord. He gives and he takes, but I'm going to bless his name anyway. I'm going to bless his name at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. We must have an altar in our lives that we go to every single day. Every day, every day, every day, every day. And we have to be willing to lay down anything and everything that God might ask of us. We have to learn to trust God with everything. Hannah trusted God and because of it, he blessed her with a child. Point number three. Hannah did not become bitter because of her circumstance. In a day and age in which feelings rule and offenses seemingly around every corner, it would have been understandable for Hannah to be upset and bitter. From a worldly viewpoint, if Hannah would have gotten offended and bitter with her circumstances, we would have been okay with that. When grapes are put into a wine press and they begin to be squeezed and crushed and strained, we see what they are really made of. What comes out in the time of crushing proves how valuable the grapes really are. When we are put into difficult situations, what comes out says a lot about who we are. 
when the process of crushing takes place in our lives, when we enter the valley of the shadow of death, the words we speak and our actions speak volumes. I've been on both ends of the spectrum. When I was a little younger and I was hurt, hurt by circumstances and people's words and people's actions, I watched as anger and bitterness came out. I didn't know how to deal with the hurt. I became very angry and very depressed. I'm so thankful that God brought me out. He was gracious with me, and he was patient with me. I've been on the other side of it as well, that when I was hurt and wounded, when darkness tried to cover me, I knew who to turn to. I allowed God to take care of the situation. Did it still hurt? Absolutely. Were there still dark days? Absolutely. Were there times I felt like giving up? Absolutely. But I knew I could trust him. I knew that he would bring me out of my troubles. What we do and what we say at the moment that we are crushed shows what is really inside our hearts. Hannah showed what was really inside her heart when she fell on her face before God and wept. I think the The best part of this entire story is the fact that Hannah did not allow bitterness and offense to control her life. She could have so easily gotten distracted from God's purpose and God's plan because of the adversary being right there with her every single day. All the time, egging her on, bringing her nothing but grief and sorrow. But instead, she went to prayer. She went to intercession. She went to her altar. The only way we don't become bitter is by having a close relationship with Jesus Christ. And the only way we have a close relationship with Jesus Christ is by spending time with him in his word and through prayer. In closing, if we could get a piano, I challenge each of us to take some inventory. What am I hungry for? What am I longing for? What appetite am I feeding the most? Where's my time spent? Where is my money spent? Are those I surround myself with in my inner circle feeding my flesh or feeding my soul? What am I willing to lay down on an altar? How much like Jesus am I really? Can I cry out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Can I walk the path to Calvary to have those I love crucify me and yet, as Isaiah tells us, speak not a word? Can we kneel down before our betrayer who is one of our closest friends and wash their feet? Several years ago, I I started praying that he would make me more like him. Jesus, help me to love like you love. Take me out of me and fill me with you. So in order for that to happen, he had to start cutting some things out of my life. There was some anger there that I didn't really know that was there. And so he put me into situations in which he could reveal to me that I had a problem with anger. There were ungodly lusts in my heart for things of this world, but I didn't know that I had those things in my heart unless he put me into situations in which he could reveal that to me. There was pride. So once again, he put me in situations to show me the pride needed to come out. He's still working on me. I have a long, long way to go. But I just want to be close to him. I just want to be like him. When those times of crushing come, I just, I want his fruit to come out of me. I want his fruit to flow through me. I don't want bitterness and anger and and pride and hatred to come out. But I want love and patience and long-suffering I want his fruit to come out of me. Back in the time of uh, prayer and and fasting in January, 
the Lord started dealing with me about telling the story that I'm about to tell. I've told maybe four or five people. In fact, I, a few weeks ago, I just told my wife about it. It's something that I've, I've held in. and I, I know that some of you might not understand this story or the significance of this story, but I'm going to be very transparent very vulnerable but I believe this is what God wants me to speak December of 2016 I sat in my pastor's office with a man that I had once called my best friend he had not been allowed to come to church for some time because of his actions and his transgressions will call them against me pastor had given me the liberty to say what, when he could come back and, and God had been dealing with me through his word about reconciliation that Jesus Christ has reconciled us unto himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation he had been dealing with me about where Paul says in Ephesians if a man be overtaken in his fault ye which are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. So with that much prayer, I decided that it was time to have a face-to-face -face meeting to allow him to come back to church. And as I sat there and I listened to his apologies and listened to him beg for forgiveness, which I was anticipating, I was expecting that. What I didn't expect was the question that he would ask me. In a sign of humility, he asked if he could wash my feet. And instantly, as, as, as loud as God has ever spoken to me before, he said, could you wash the feet of Judas? Because I did. I didn't even know that was in the Bible. I had to go back home that night and look it up because I didn't even know that Jesus actually washed the feet of Judas. So after some time, I allowed it. I allowed the man that had been my closest friend who had betrayed me beyond anything I could have ever imagined to kneel down and to wash my feet and to pray over me. And once he was done, I stood up and I told him to take a seat. And I picked up the towel and I washed the feet of the Judas in my life. I can't put into words the power of the Holy Ghost that swept through that place. The power of God that filled that room. And I don't tell you to say, hey, look what I did. Look at me. I tell you this to say, look at what Jesus can do. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus on earth. I long to be like him. All through life's journeys from earth to glory, I only ask to be like him. Prayer changes situations that are impossible. Prayer changes outcomes that were once inevitable. Prayer changes hearts that are cold and hardened. Prayer changes the atmosphere. But greatest of all, prayer changes the one praying the prayer. If we could all stand. We lift our hands and just begin to seek his face. Begin to lift up your voice and cry out to him.
it's worth it. To become like Him, to be close to Him. But we need to build an altar. We need to repair the altars in our lives. You can trust Him. And anything that He asks of you to lay down on the altar, anything in your life that He's saying, let's, let's cut that out. Let's remove that. Let's lay that on the altar. Let's, let's remove this from your life and let's remove that from your life. It's because He cares for you more than you could ever care for yourself. He loves you more than you could ever love yourself. So right now, whether it's where you're at or up here, let's find a place to pray. Let's rebuild our altars. Let's prepare a place for Him to dwell in our lives.